Hey church family, welcome. Thank you so much for being here for our 9 a.m. worship service. We're so thankful that you've joined us. If this is your first time, please go to our website. It's findnewlife.church slash connect. We would love to connect with you. Uh, whether you're from Palmdale or from anywhere around the world, we would love to hear from you. We would love to get you some materials to grow in your Christian faith. We're out at 3500 Elizabeth Lake Road right now, and uh, we are so thankful for that property. But we're also thankful for this technology where we can connect with you. Right now, we want to worship the Lord. So Isaac, come lead us in a song. Oh 
Bless His holy name. We're going to be talking about that name, talking about loving the Lord and loving others. Uh, and today we are in our third week of our series called Get Real. It's a 10-week study through the book of James. We are so excited about this book, what God is doing in our church. We are just a, a one week into our 21 days of prayer and fasting. God has done so many remarkable things, and I can't wait to share some of those with you at the end of the service. So please stay on even after the message because I have some really, really awesome things to share uh, with you. Uh, we've been praying for the fires and uh, the lake fire, the uh, the ranch fire, the apple fire, and uh, praying for all of those who are affected and we're praying for the first responders and the firefighters who are fighting those fires. And so uh, we want to open up in a word of prayer, ask the Lord to be with our community and uh, ask the Lord to put out these fires. We're thankful for the rain yesterday and we want to continue to pray that the Lord will help us to get these fires uh, under control. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful the minister here in Northern LA County and we're thankful the minister here in Palmdale. We pray for the firefighters who are fighting these fires right now. I pray specifically for the lake fire, which is real close to us right now. I pray that you'd please be with the families who've lost their houses. Help us, Lord, to be a blessing to them. Pray for the firefighters who are fighting these fires around the clock. Lord, would they please be able to have these under control very soon. I pray that you protect them. I pray for this message. I pray for those who have joined us. Lord, I pray for those that, that have joined us who are hopeless, Lord. Would you please give them hope? I pray for those who have joined us, Lord, and they do not know you. I pray that they would have a, a relationship with you as a result of, of hearing your word and coming to faith. I pray that you would please help our church to rally around these 21 days of prayer and fasting. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would give us uh, a time of worship, uh, in a great time of surrender to you these next few weeks in this series in James. Help us to get real uh, by having real love as a result of today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in the book of James, and last week we said that the book of James is split up into the first chapter telling us what we're going to learn, and then the next four chapters telling us the specifics. And today we're diving into the one of those specific topics, and we're talking about real love. And if you're going to get real in your Christianity, if you're going to mature in your Christianity, if I'm going to mature in my Christianity, I have to know what real love is. See, loving God is at the baseline of every Christian. Loving God and from a real heart loving God. And how do you love God? You love others. You love God by loving God others. You see, in James chapter 2, we're going to be in the first 13 verses, but in James chapter 2 and verse number 8, it says that if we fulfill the royal law in the scriptures uh, by, by fulfilling what Jesus said, and he continues, James, 1, or James 2, 8, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Friend, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Now, when I told Danielle that I loved her, uh, man, it was over 15 years ago. Uh, when I told her I loved her for the first time, I surprised her, flew out to, uh, to, to drop the L-bomb, as couples say. Uh, I wanted to tell her for the first time, I love you. And it was a big deal. And, and uh, her family knew about it. My family knew about it. And we were just excited about uh, this new stage, you know, and dating couples have stages. They still do. And the names change, but their stages are basically the same, you know, the starting stage and the steady stage, the stable stage, the, you know, the, the sturdy stage, whatever the stages are, you know, and, and, uh, and we were going to enter into this new stage. No longer were we just and like, we are going to be in love. Man, we are excited about this. And so I, I took her down to the beach and, and I, I told her that I loved her. Now, when I said that I love you to Danielle, I, I really meant it, but I truly did not know what love was. In fact, if I'm honest with you today, I loved myself at that moment more than I loved her. I didn't even know what love was. I didn't know what real love was in a relationship, yet I told her, I love you. Now, thankfully, she said it back, and we would go on to learn that true and lasting and real love can only come through real expense, through real sacrifice. Love is a choice. 
Love is not a feeling predominantly, and, and, and I made that choice. I said I loved you, but it would be a multiple choice. It would be a choice that I would make multiple times. I'm still making that choice today. And every Christian, every husband, every dad, every mother, every wife has to make that choice. Am I going to love? And what that choice means is, am I going to sacrifice at a great expense? Now, there's two choices for real love uh, that I want to go over today. And there's just two points today. Uh, and it is this. We must choose uh, self-sacrifice over self-indulgence. And then we're going to see from James 2 how we must choose true value over perceived value. Now, let's look at both of these. First of all, uh, real love chooses self-sacrifice over self-indulgence. Self-sacrifice over self-indulgence. You see, love is a choice to sacrifice something that you have. To, to, to self-sacrifice in order to express true value. And, and self-sacrifice, letter A in your notes, self-sacrifice is the only cure to people-pleasing. Now, if you haven't downloaded the notes, I want you to download the notes because I want you to see what it says in this verse and, and, and or open up your Bibles to James 2. And, and I want you to see what it says uh, in James 2 about people-pleasing. Because, you know, a lot of times we think, well, if I'm pleasing people, I'm loving them, right? And nothing could be more further from the truth. And so you can actually go to our website, findnewlife.church slash messages. You can download these notes. You can kind of read along. But why is true love, real love, uh, choosing self-sacrifice over self-indulgence? Well, uh, because people-pleasing is a problem. And in verse number four, he asks this question. He says, are you not partial in yourselves? <laughs> Do you not judge evil thoughts? Like, isn't everyone somewhat partial? Doesn't everyone please people? And verse one, he kind of breaks down the, the people-pleasing problem. He says, brethren, have not faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons? Now, before I get into the respect of persons, I have to tell you that, that one of the greatest titles that Jesus has is this title that's mentioned in verse 1 of James 2, the Lord of glory. Now, this is, this is a title exclusively used in uh, this passage, but, but it's, it's referenced kind of in, in greetings and other ways throughout other books. But when it says that Jesus is the Lord of glory, it's a great title because it places the emphasis on Jesus's position of receiving glory, and it's precisely the position that we are constantly pursuing. You know, all of us want to be the Lord of glory. You, you ask how? Well, we're always jockeying for position. Have you ever noticed that? It's a lot like musical chairs. I grew up playing musical chairs, and, and uh, as, as you play musical chairs, it comes down to one chair. And, and you're circling that chair, waiting, waiting for the music to stop. And what happens when the music stops? And both people are trying to claw at the chair, trying to be seated first. Why? Because only one person can win. Only one person can sit in that seat. And friend, only one person sits in the seat of glory. And when we receive the glory that's due to Jesus's name, we are sitting in in that seat, you see, self-indulgent says, if I please people, ultimately I'm pleasing myself. But we were not made to please ourselves. We were not even made to please others. We were made to please one. And his name is Jesus Christ, God's son. And so I want to give you uh, just a, a thought today about the fact that we are short of glory. He deserves all glory, but we have fallen short of glory. In fact, in Romans 3.23, it says this, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The perfection, the essence, the word glory is doxa. It's the weight. It's something of such value that it weighs a lot. And, and we have come short of that glory. We have sinned. We have come short of his 
self-perfection and self-indulgence. It drives the pursuit of pleasing people because ultimately you think that in pleasing people, one day they will please you. One day they will give you the glory that you really desire. So here's a key thought. You cannot constantly try to please people and consistently love people at the same time. Why? Because it's from a selfish motive. In fact, self-love is the enemy of real love. Why? Because God's idea of love is self-sacrifice. He actually puts self-sacrifice as the number one priority for love. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, John 15. He also said in that same chapter, greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Man, self-sacrifice is so rare today, but it is so, uh, so prevalent in Scripture, yet we don't see it in our lives. And real love is self-sacrificial love, not selfish love. People-pleasing is not God's will. It's not God's plan. And that's what uh, Ephesians 6 says. In fact, Ephesians 6, uh, verse 6, it says, Not with eye service as men-pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. And it says, with good will, doing service to the Lord and not unto men. Often we do things. I do things. And I do things because someone's watching. I do things because I want the praise. I want someone to see me doing something good. But God says, do it to them, but do it through them. Do it through them to me. Why? Because otherwise everything else is a selfish motive. Everything else is a posture. Everything else is trying to take the seat, trying to take the throne that is only reserved for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So when compliments come, praise becomes the prize. And when praise becomes the prize, uh, then pride begins to rise. But when the result of deflecting that praise starts to create a big heart, we start to lose the desire for the praise in the first place. In fact, someone said this, those with a big head tend to have a small heart. But those who look for ways to sacrifice and, and, and to the, with the desire to invest in others have the largest heart, the heart that wants to not have self-indulgence, but wants to invest in the lives of others. So here's an action item. I would encourage you this week to look for ways to sacrifice, look for ways to invest in others with no expectation of anything in return. So self-indulgence is, is, is one option, but self-sacrifice is another. And when we self-sacrifice, we cure our natural desire to please others. But I want you to see letter B. Letter B in that choice of self-indulgence versus self-sacrifice. I want you to see letter B because letter B is, and I want you to see in verse 5, we see that self-indulgence is temporary, but self-denial is eternal. Now, verse 5, it says this, My beloved brethren, Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which hath promised to them that love him? What is he saying? Is he saying you can't be rich in faith and rich in funds? That's what it sounds like to me, right? Like God has only chosen the poor. No, no, no. He's talking about self-denial. He's saying, he's not saying that only the poor can, can have self-denial. He's not elevating the poor. He's actually just saying that money is, is just, it makes it a little bit more difficult to deny yourself. It actually makes the temptation for self-indulgence greater. And so money is not wrong. In fact, we all, according to the standards of our world, are rich. So can we not have rich faith? No. We just need to understand that when we're given a lot, when we're given much, that much is required, and that the temptation for self-indulgence is greater. And so money's not wrong. In fact, gold was God's idea. God said where Adam should go get the gold, and God all throughout the Bible blesses people with wealth. But those who have been given much have a much greater level of temptation for this self-indulgence, 
for this uh, lack of self-denial. Now, this is why we're in uh, 21 days of prayer and fasting. And some of you say, what's fasting? Okay, is it fast? No, it actually slows things way down. Uh, it, it, it's not fast, okay? It, the word fast uh, just is, is a, uh, a means to give something up, a, a pause, if you will. And fasting is never about the body. People say, oh, I'm, I'm fasting because I want to lose weight, or I'm fasting because I have a habit that I need a break, or whatever. Fasting is never about the body, it's always about the soul. Fasting is always uh, not about what you're giving up. It's always about what you're making room for in order to uh, tell yourself that you're not willing to crowd the most important things in life out. So abundance is often the enemy of what's, what's important in our life. And the importance in our life, it can be crowded out by abundance. Empathy is often crowded out by abundance. But regardless of how much or how little you have, it takes great faith to trust God's process and plan in order to show love to someone who may never know and who may never care. And so often something that we need to understand is that if God blesses us with something, he's often blessing us with that very thing so that we can be a blessing to someone around us. So here's a key thought. Money or position, that's, that's what you have. That's not who you are. Value and importance is who you are in the kingdom. Many have, have falsely uh, associated money with true value in this life. Friend, if you have a lot of money, you're worth the same to God as if you have no money to your name right now. And so God values eternal things not temporary things. And it's important to understand that eternal things are settled. Your, report, your value and importance in Christ is settled. Regardless of what happens in life, regardless uh, of, of what we do in life, our importance and value is settled in Christ. And this is what we see in James 1.12 when he says that we are, we are given a crown uh, when we uh, endure temptation. And it's a crown that will last throughout eternity. We will cast at his feet and it's promised to them that love him. You say, well, wait a second. I, I thought Jesus, uh, that everything's leveled at the cross. I mean, how in the world are we receiving crowns because of something that we've done? I thought that uh, it didn't matter what we've done. Well, listen, friend, yes, everything that we do wrong is paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, but make no mistake, 1 Corinthians 3, we will give an account for who we've loved and how we've loved them. That's important. So here's an action item. This week, I would encourage you to offer expressions of love to God by loving someone who most likely can never love you back. When was the last time you Love someone unconditionally, meaning you gave them something with no expectation of anything in return. So this first point, let me give you a takeaway. Real love is self-sacrificed, self-sacrifice based on God's values, not our own. That's real love. It's self-sacrifice in action based on God's values, not our own. Now let's talk about God's values because number two, Real love chooses true value over perceived value. Now, uh, I don't know if you've ever done this, and I'm just going to tell you, tell you the truth, okay? And if you haven't done this, man, you're much better than I have. But there have been some times when I got something on clearance, and I've given it to someone as a gift, okay? And I took off the clearance uh, price tag, and I left the larger price tag on there so that there would be a greater perceived value. Now, maybe you've never done that. Uh, may, maybe you've never led someone to believe that you purchased something at a greater price than you really did, but I have. And I think a lot of times we, we, we want people to think that we have a, a greater uh, investment than we're really willing to give. And by the way, here's a little side note for any relationships that might be struggling or, or, or going through a uh, difficulty. Most relationships struggle and fail because someone in the relationship is being dishonest about a price tag. And by the way, the Bible talks a lot about this, that a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. 
That's talking about lying about the price of something. Uh, saying that it's not, I mean, she'll get over it. Or, I ah, mean, he, he doesn't care. And, and, and really, the, the reality is they do care. It does matter. Uh, communicating thanks does matter. Communicating love does matter. And that's a whole other sermon for another day. But I want to tell you that communicating the true value, not just the perceived value, is important. And so we need to choose this true value. Now, how do we do this? Well, letter A, we need to understand that distorted values lead to empty labels. Distorted values lead to empty labels. Let's just pick up where we left off. We're going verse by verse through James 2. It says, but ye have despised the poor. Whoa. Uh, You've despised the poor? What is he talking about? Well, he asks a rhetorical question. He says, do not rich men oppress you and draw you before judgment seats? So he's saying the same people you're trying to be like, you actually don't like. You're actually trying to uh, say that you're this way or, or, or you want to be like them, but, but they don't like you. In fact, they're the ones coming for you. They're the ones oppressing you. How do we know this? Well, in verse 2, it says, If there be any come into your assembly, so the church, and a man with a gold ring or uh, in goodly apparel, why did he mention a gold ring and 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 goodly apparel? Is Is he against good clothes or a gold ring? No. He was actually referencing something that was very common in that day. In the Roman uh, regions of that day, there were these rich people who would loan out their gold rings and their really nice robes. They would actually rent them out so that you could feel rich for a day or look rich at a certain party. You know, that stuff happens still today. In fact, when when I uh, was going to propose to Danielle and uh, I, I lied and told her that my car was having trouble, uh, and which was totally believable. I mean, it was a, it was a piece of junk, uh, but, but I, I pulled up in a brand new, I had rented a brand new convertible uh, Camaro. Man, that thing was beautiful. Actually, no, it was a Mustang. And a Ford Mustang, I pulled up in that thing, and man, it felt so good because I wasn't in my 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 college car that was, you know, uh, an old Taurus. No, man, I was in a brand new sports car. Man, I was so thankful to pull up in that. I felt so legit, right? Now, I had rented that car. She knew I had rented that car. But let's say I got down on one knee. And right when I got up and we were taking pictures, I leaned over and I said, hey, get some pictures of that rock fast because I rented that ring for this night. She would, she would be livid. In fact, she'd probably take it off and throw it at me, right? Well, no one rents a ring for an engagement. Well, maybe people do. I don't know. But, but that would be crazy. Why? Because the label engagement comes at a cost. It comes at the cost of the diamond ring to say, I'm all in, I'm committed. And the label that you are a son or a daughter of God comes at a price. And the price was the blood of Jesus Christ. And when you put that label on you, there are some expectations. And when we distort the value of who we are in Jesus Christ, we we live and breathe and put on empty labels. How do we know he's talking about this? Well, because he says, you want to act like you're all that and lift up the rich. But he says in verse 7, let's just keep reading. Do not they blaspheme the worthy name by which ye are called? Whoa, now he's referencing one of the Ten Commandments. And look it in your notes. Exodus 27, verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord shall hold him guiltless, shall not hold him guiltless, that taketh his name in vain. Whoa. Now, is this talking about cursing? Well, it could be, okay? Uh, you know, you know, whenever, whenever someone says uh, the name of Jesus or Jesus Christ in vain, certainly that applies But you know what predominantly this commandment's talking about? It's talking about wearing an empty label. It's talking about distorting the value of God's name. 
See, when you become a son's a son or a daughter of God. And by the way, but as many as received him, John 1.12 says, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Once you put that label on, you bear his name, friend. And friend, one of the things that we all need to remember is we are commanded not to take the name, to wear the label as a son of God or a daughter of God, child of God. We do not want to wear that name in vain. And so if you take that name as a wife takes a husband's name, if you wear that name in vain, you will not be held guiltless. So why is he talking about partiality and why is he talking about, uh, you know, taking this name in vain is because they were discriminating against the poor and they were elevating the rich because they wanted to self-indulge themselves. And what they were doing is they were saying, God favors the rich more than he does the poor. And friend, that is not the case. That is not the case. In fact, the decision not to live up to our new name that we've been given is the choice to devalue what God says is valuable and to devalue the God that we serve. This is why discrimination is so evil because it devalues what God values. The people of the first century church were discriminating against the poor, meaning it's not bad to treat treat the rich nice in, in, in a nice way. But it's terrible to treat the rich nice and the poor like they're dirt. And so he was calling them out on this. Discrimination against the poor, it, it, it was happening and, and, and it was devaluing what God had said was value. We all have value in Jesus Christ. And so here's a key thought. Our culture often rejects financial poverty but readily accepts relational, emotional, and spiritual poverty. You ever notice that? People want to look rich, want to be rich, and yet internally they're so bankrupt, they're so poor. Why is that? I, I just believe that this comes back to the fact of what J James is saying. He's saying we can't pick and choose which commandment we like the most or which commandment we're going to focus on. Because friend, in verse number nine, he says, if you have respect of persons, ye commit sin. It's a sin, plain and simple. It's sin. As much as sin is in, in verse 10 uh, to commit adultery uh, and as much sin is in verse 11 uh, to kill, it is a sin to be a people pleaser. It is a sin uh, to be a respecter of persons. This is one of the reasons why I don't believe any pastor should ever know what everyone gives in the church. I just don't believe you could possibly know that and serve people equally. So here's an action item. I believe that this week we should all write down what God values and, and, and focus in on those values and, and look at the needs of our spouse and look at the needs of our kids and look at the needs of our friends and family and, and people around us and, and people who God has given us influence. Look at them through the value that God gives, the eternal value, the eternal perspective that God gives. And so we see that distorted values, they lead to empty labels. But then finally, True values lead to empathy and action. And that's what I want. And I know that's what you want. Empathy in action. Verse 8 says, If you fulfill the royal law, and this is the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, you do well. Verse 12 says, So speak ye, and so do. <laughs> Don't just speak, but do. So be a hearer of the word, not, a, but, but also be a doer. And don't just be a speaker of the word, but do, be a doer. I, I think this is an interesting parallel from chapter 1 and verse uh, 23 through 25, and then chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, because verse 13 says, Ye have judgment, if ye have judgment without mercy, that 
mercy will not be showed to you. In fact, it says mercy rejoiceth uh, against judgment, meaning mercy, the mercy we give to others is the same mercy we're going to receive on judgment day. You say, I thought Jesus provided mercy for everyone. There's no more condemnation. Friend, our sins have been paid for, but our love will be accounted for. We will give an account for the real love, the real sacrifice that we give to others. So let me illustrate it this way. All of us have a voice, and all of us can use that voice. All of us should. All of us have a voice in voting. All of us should vo vote this November. All of us have a voice with our family and our friends. We should use that voice to, uh, to, to shed light and, and to be salt and, and, and to preserve that which is good. We all should use our voice. But sometimes it's easier to use our voice than to use our empathy. What do I mean by that? Well, you can choose to use your voice or you can choose to do what Jesus did. And Jesus, when the disciples were often arguing or were jockeying for a seat at the head table. He often got a towel and a basin of water, dirty foot water, and he just started washing their feet. You see, he knew that actions, they always speak louder than words. My mom used to always say, your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. <laughs> it's so true that empathy in action is Christ-likeness, that empathy in action is what we need. So what are you gonna do with your towel? What are you gonna do with your time, energy, effort this week? You can throw in the towel. You can use your towel on yourself, or you can choose to invest your towel, your time, your service into others. Anyone can talk about being loving, Anyone can say that they intend to love, but love is not about intention. It's not really even just about emotion. Love is about empathy and action. And that's the takeaway. The takeaway is this, that the, that the key to true love is empathy and action. Now I've given you a lot of different action items. I'm gonna give you one more, and then I'm gonna give you all the action items that are kind of at the end. And it builds an acrostic. I think it'll be a help to you. And so here it is. The, the final action item for today is to express empathy through listening and responding to the greatest needs around you. You know, you don't know the greatest needs if you don't listen. This is why James 1.19 says, be slow to speak, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. And so this is what we want to be as a church. Remember verse 27, we read last week, uh, the end of chapter one, pure religion undefiled is this, uh, and before the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. We have to show our love to others through service. And so here's some takeaways. Here's just some action items, and they spell love. L, look for ways to specifically invest into others. O, uh, offer love to those who may never know or may never even care. V, Value other people based on God's perspective, not your own. You might say, that person, they, they don't care. They're, they, they'll never, they, they, I'll never help them again. Careful. E, express real empathy by responding to real needs. There are real needs all around us. And may we respond the way that Christ would. Let's pray. Lord, I ask and pray that you will please help us as a church to not just say we want to love our neighbor, but Lord, really show it. I pray that this week we would have a groundswell of people who desire to do your will, who desire to help others, Lord, who desire to love you by loving others. Give us real love. Lord, not fake hypocritical love that, that says one thing and does another, but Lord, real, lasting sacrificial love. Friend, I want to thank you for joining in. And before I let you go, I, I want to just ask you in, in this moment before we end, do you know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? If you don't, all you have to do is call out to him. If you believe in your heart, 
that God sent Jesus to die and he rose again for your sin, friend, I would encourage you to call out to him today. You can call out to him right now. Just say, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I know that I can never do anything to pay for my sin. I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. I believe you died and rose again for the forgiveness of my sin. So I receive that gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to reach out to us. You can actually just text us at 661-450-8761. 661-450-8761. Friend, if you're like, how do I express my love? I would encourage you to text that number as well. If you would like to serve this week, if you are not on one of our serve teams, we're ramping up serve opportunities uh, because we have a, a new location very soon that we're going to be able to serve from. And uh, it's 450 uh, in 5th uh, Avenue uh, West here in West Palmdale, just down the street, right by uh, Palmdale Hospital. So 5th Street West here in West Palmdale. Uh, we're going to be having lots of serve opportunities within the next few days. And so if you're not already signed up as a Dream Team member, sign up today. That's something you can practically do. You say, I don't know how to serve. I don't know what to do to show love. I don't know how to sacrifice my time. I don't know how to use my towel uh, in order to show love to those around you. Well, we can help. And I would encourage you to text that number. If you're not on a serve team, text that number 661-650-8761. We'll get you signed up today and text us your email so that we can sign you up. You'll get an email from uh, our uh, church database, which is our planning center and we'll make sure that you're signed up uh, with that. We are excited that many new people are joining us every single week. We've had guests every single week of this pandemic, and we're thankful for that. And if you're brand new and you'd like to connect with us, you can go on our website at findnewlife.church connect. Also, uh, you can text that number 661-450-8761, and we would love to hear from you. We would love to connect with you. Uh, as well. I wanted to tell you about our 21 days of prayer and fasting. I would encourage everyone to give up something every single day uh, the next couple weeks in order to make room for what God is going to do and what he's going to grow in your life. Prayer is not our last resort. It's our first priority. So I would encourage you to spend some extra time in prayer, prayer for our country, prayer for the fires, prayer for the pandemic, prayer for our city and prayer for your church family and for your pastor. I would really uh, covet the prayers and we will be praying for you. Uh, this coming Wednesday, the men are continuing the Temptation series, Overcoming Temptation. It's been a great study. If you don't have the book Escape, uh, written by Stephen Chapel, we would love to get you that book. And uh, if you don't have that book, you can just text us. We'll make sure to get you a copy uh, before Wednesday's uh, Bible study. Also, Thursdays at 7, Wednesdays at 7, the men meet. Thursdays at 7, the women meet. And they are, they are meeting to discuss the book of Esther. They've really enjoyed this study on the sovereignty of God and just everything that God has uh, taught them. Uh, I've heard so many great uh, things from the ladies about this. And so if you'd like to join Danielle, my wife, on Thursday, you can text uh, our texting number as well, and we'll make sure to get you the Zoom link. Uh, you can text about the men's group as well, or you can go on our website and just register for those uh, if you would like. The final thing I wanna tell you is that we have seen some amazing answer to prayer. We prayed for rain, we got rain. We prayed for uh, some people to be healed from the coronavirus, tested negative the next day. We prayed for people who uh, thought they had cancer, biopsies came back negative. God is answering prayer here at New Life. And if you have a prayer request, we want to watch God answer that prayer during the 21 days of prayer and fasting. So if you want to uh, submit your, your prayer request, just email it to info at findnewlife.church or text it to the text number that I've given a couple times, 661-450-8761. We are excited about God answering so many prayers during the season. We want you to pray uh, as well. We also have a, a special opportunity this afternoon called a deeper look. If you would like the Zoom, Zoom link, I'm going to take the study that we did today and take a deeper look. I didn't give one Greek uh, word or, or definition. All of those will be given in the deeper look. I'm going to break this passage down 
uh, step by step. We're going to take a half an hour and then some questions. And I think it'll be a blessing to you. I think you'll grow as a result of it. Let's end in prayer and then we'll be dismissed. God, thank you for everyone who has joined us. I pray that you'll help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that you'd help us to love you by loving others around us. I pray for those who made decisions today. Help them not to be weary in well-doing, for in due season they shall reap when they faint not. I pray that all of those who are going through a time of adversity, help them to have strong, strong, uh, a strong heart, and Lord, help their strength not to fail. I pray that you'd help those who need provision. Would you please provide for them? God, thank you for what you're doing in this moment at our church. I pray that you'd please continue to provide for those uh, who want to be generous toward others. I pray that you continue to provide for the needs of the church. I pray that those who uh, can give would give. I pray for those who can serve will serve. Well, thank you for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless.